Hi. Hi, everyone. Uh, it's good to see some familiar faces and some new faces as well. I am so glad you are here today. My name is Sarah McAllister. I am the Senior Director of Alumni Career and Professional Development here in the office, not here because I'm home, but in the Office of Alumni Relations at Tulane University. Uh, we are delighted to have Lelia Galland here with us today. Um, I've had the pleasure and privilege of knowing Lelia in multiple aspects uh, for many years now, and I was honored to see her live give a version of this uh, presentation uh, a couple months ago. And I know at, in every core of my body that you will get a ton out of it today. I'm excited to just hear from her and connect with you all. Quick intro if you are not familiar with Lelia. So she is described as the confidence fairy godmother we all need. Lelia is a writer, a speaker, and a generally just amazing human being. She has written over 150 articles in national publications, including Huffington Post, Forbes, and Harper's Bazaar. And today she is going to lead us through just a very deep and rich conversation. Um, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to hand it over to you, Lelia. Fabulous. Thank you so much for having me, Sarah. Lovely to be with you all today. So I'm going to ask Sarah to share. I'm going to give you like Maybe oh, maybe five more seconds to complete the poll if you haven't yet. These are very high stakes questions, obviously. And then we will share the results. Okay, it looks like it came out twice, Sarah. All right, we'll give it just another moment. Sorry about that. If you if you are seeing it again for a second time, go ahead and answer it again. <laughs> In case you change. Yeah, you, you now you can change your mind. If you were like, I thought more about it and this does feel like I want teenage me to pick out my clothes. Okay, I'm seeing some definite trends in my in the responses. I'm gonna close it in five, four, three, two, one. All right, Sarah, close it up and please share the results. Okay, so <laughs> I see some folks nodding. Well, like, obviously this is the right choice. So go ahead and share in the chat why you picked the answer you did. I'm very curious. Also, I'm loving to see what is making people laugh and smile recently. I also left, I'm just kind of like alarmed by the conclusion of White Lotus. I have a lot of thoughts. We can table that. I've pitched some articles on um, Valencia and her storyline. I have uh, a lot of insights, I think, on, into that. So go ahead and share in the chat and I'll put in the chat why you picked the answer you did. Yeah, Teenage Wardrobe had many things that were back in style. Interesting. <laughs> and he says, it's a lot of how do you spell X, Y, Z because it is hard. I get that. Um, the 90s like trends are very much back. So if you were a teenager in the 90s, that's easy. Some people, it's like, you know what? I only cut my hair every so often. So it's, it wouldn't be that much of a stretch. And then the seventh grade picture, I'm really curious who was like, yeah, absolutely. No problem. Seventh grade me looked great versus the Google chat. Did anyone feel like, oh yeah, easy peasy seventh grade. It seemed like a good contingent. Jersey hair. I love it. The, the Google searches, and I had a friend say like, oh yeah, what if I forgot to go into cognito for a really embarrassing one? Would not want that to be public information. Yeah, okay, fabulous. All right, Jill. Well, thank you so much for um, that silliness. I delight in these would you rather games to get us started and kind of percolating on the topic of the day. So as Sarah mentioned, my name is Lelia Gowland and I am absolutely thrilled to be with you all today. You may be able to hear from my very sinusy voice that um, you're getting me in my very authentic cold recovery state. Um, hopefully we, we don't have any coughing fits in the midst of it. But I wanna start us off with a story, well, two stories about my teeth, actually. So when I was 13, maybe 12 to 13, I got braces and I had them for about two years. And at the very end of my orthodonture, um, my, my dentist told me or my orthodontist told me that I had to have rubber bands and I had to basically wire my jaw shut every night. And if I did it every night, then I would get my braces off sooner. 
I had an overbite and this was like the last thing he needed to correct. So three months later, I go back into the orthodontist's office and he says, Lilia, you have a slight underbite. Well, how often were you wearing your rubber bands? And I said, every night. And he was aghast because what 13 year old follows instructions so exactly? And I was like, well, you told me to wear them every night. And so of course I would like, if I forgot, I would like get up and be real nervous and put them on. Every single night I wore my rubber bands, thus giving myself an overbite or an underbite rather. And so the, the takeaway here is like, I am extremely compliant. Like, tell me the rules. I will love to know what the boundaries are, what the container is, and I will follow it, right? Since an early age. And then my second experience with my teeth, which is rather telling into my personality, was in 2012, so a full decade ago now, I managed a political campaign. And every event we would host, people would come up to me, this is farther along in the campaign, people would come up to me and say, my God, you are so good at this. I know who I'm going to ask to run my campaign when I run for office. And I would say, and I will recommend someone who is wonderful because I absolutely hated it. I cried every day for the first three months. And it turns out after the fact, I learned I cracked three teeth from daytime teeth clenching because I wear a bite guard at night, right? So like my level of anxiety and managing my um, emotions and my mental health in this role were not good. I was really struggling. And so while I was interacting with elected officials and people who were seeing me, you know, very successful campaign events that had a lot of turnout, what they saw on the outside was miraculously to me, the facade of a very organized campaign manager who knew what they were doing. Whereas every time my friend Jim came to volunteer, I would have him walk with me around the block so that I could cry. And my team wouldn't, they knew I was crying, but they didn't actually see me crying at least. And I share these two stories about my teeth because when it comes to authenticity, first and foremost, let me give you the bad news. There are no rules. There is no clear and definitive line that says this is where oversharing begins and where authenticity ends. I wish there were. I promise you, if I knew them, I would tell you. And I would be very excited personally myself to have that clear indicator. But that doesn't exist. And so as we're talking together, we're going to be navigating it together and talking about how fluid it is and how much it is about what is in alignment for you in that moment, in that setting with that person. And then the second, you know, as I'm thinking about interacting with my friend Jim versus interacting with the elected officials, the second is authenticity and identity aren't static. They change and evolve over time and in different settings. So what was authentic to me in those interactions with Jim was like, hey, let's take a lap. I need to move my body and cry. But what was authentic with the elected official was like, and I'm a little bit salty in disposition. And, and so I could playfully say, you know what? I'll recommend someone who's great. Like this, this was a, a gift to Dana. I'm really committed to my friend. And so this is the candidacy that I'm focused on, but I'm not gonna run political campaigns for a living, right? And that was authentic and true to me. And it doesn't make me inauthentic that I wasn't sharing. I just cried 45 minutes ago when I took a lap with Jim, right? Nobody thinks I was being inauthentic because I wasn't sobbing as I talked to a state rep. So as we move through these conversations today, I'll share a little bit about my why, right? We'll go through our agenda. I'll share a little bit about what brings me to this work myself. We'll have breakout sessions and large group discussion. And then we'll tell stories. Right? You'll hear some of the experiences that really inspire me when I think about authenticity in action, particularly in professional settings. So feel free to eat. I love seeing kiddos. Hey, Brianna. I love seeing all of the different things that are happening in our lives. A-OK. -okay. And I understand if being on camera is not accessible right now. I had somebody email me and say, hey, I'm going to be in and out of the operating room. Is it okay if I'm by phone? And I'm like, yeah, don't bring me into the operating room. Co-sign. Put me in your ears when it's safe and move with me. Love it. So anytime I'm asking for interactivity, that's an invitation, not an obligation. A-OK -okay not to participate and just be in listening mode. We'll use the chat feature at 10. Um, if you want to raise your hand, you go at the bottom of your screen, click participants. I think everybody knows this by now, but good to have a refresher um, and hit the raise hand button. If you struggle with that, you can pop into the chat and just say raise hand. 
So we're going to use different methods for different types of learners. Um, we're going to have this recorded. Um, Nicole or Sarah will share afterwards in the chat and then later via email um, the video recording of this. And then we also have our joy book, which is our interactive guide that has a step-by-step -step process for everything we're gonna do in breakout sessions. And then on page three, there's an area you can take notes if you wanna keep everything together. So Sarah's gonna pop that into the chat now. Um, and the PDF, I'm not sure if we're gonna have that, but the link is right there and the recorded version you've got right there. So now when you think about authenticity, what one to three words come to mind? And just go ahead and pop that into the chat. What one to three words come to mind when you think about authenticity? Real, raw, vulnerable. Ooh, lots of vulnerable. <laughs> Scary. Yeah. Honest, true. Hmm. Really interesting to see so much reflection about honesty. And I think that's a really beautiful framing device. One of the things, so let me pause here and say, one of the things I love about virtual sessions is the opportunity for so much more engagement. Because if we were, I deliberately don't have how many people are in this room, I, I can't see that. But if we were to have all of us in one room, all of us could not be yelling at the same time these words, it would just be a cacophony. But we can see this trend that, that honesty is, is something that came up for a lot of you. And I want to come back to that theme throughout because it allows us to say, what is honest doesn't mean every facet of our being at all times, right? What is honest is there are lots of different parts of our identity or experience that we could share that is true, that's true to us. And so the definition that I use is true to your own identity, personality, values, and spirit, regardless of pressure to act otherwise. So I'm gonna share it in the chat. And Sarah just shared the um, PDF if you haven't accessed it, it's right there and we'll use it in a few minutes. But the definition of authenticity, true to your own identity, personality, values, and spirit, regardless of the pressure to act otherwise. So you've heard me say this, Authenticity isn't about displaying every facet of our identity to everyone, everywhere, all the time in the same exact way. And I think a struggle for so many of us is asking, how do I show up at work in a way that feels true to me, but doesn't make it harder for me to do my job? So I want to pause here and share. Um, so this was my, I can't even fit all the way in the camera, right? This was my Mardi Gras costume this year. And you can see it's pretty fun. Nobody expects me to give a keynote speech with a giant googly eye on my head, just as no one expects me to show up at, you know, St. Anne on Mardi Gras day at the, in, in the French Quarter to show up in business casual. Now I'm wearing flip-flops right now because this is virtual, but you get the point. And no one perceives me to be inauthentic because I've shifted how I'm showing up. Both are very true to me. I have a wall of costumes right behind the, the uh, monitor. And I have a whole closet downstairs of things I wear to work. And the invitation I want to offer is authenticity can have that same kind of fluidity that we have about, you know, what we wear to a Taylor Swift dance party on Friday night. PSA, it's at the Domino if you're in New Orleans. And what we wear to our, you know, work meeting on Thursday morning. And it doesn't make us inauthentic in either instance. So for me, I spent a lot of my life considering my sexuality and my sexual orientation. I defined myself as a whatever. And it was based on a Maria Bello essay uh, written in like 2012 in Modern Love, where she talked about her fluid sexual orientation. And I, re I related deeply. And I felt like, oh, this is great. I can be living beyond labels. And it felt really aligned with my own experience of my identity. I said, you know, I don't have a type, right? I've dated a trans man, a woman, and an FBI agent with arm muscles the size of my waist, right? Like really runs the gamut. And then, you know, fast forward a bit, I married a cisgender man. We had a child together and bought a house that literally came with a white picket fence. And so I present as like a super straight femme married mom in the South, right? That's how I look. 
And then I realized earlier this year that avoiding labels had become a form of hiding. That for me, that that value that I got that felt really good of like, oh, I'm just moving through the world, I'm beyond labels, was actually a way of, of hiding a part of myself that I was, I had in some internalized homophobia, that I was very comfortable as an activist, very active in the LGBTQ plus community since college as an activist, but in my own identity, I really struggled. And I felt like I didn't count as queer. Quite literally, I was a development director of a nonprofit many years ago. And I was filling out a grant application and a diversity minded funder asked how many members of your team identify as LGBTQ plus. And I went to a queer colleague who I was out to and I said, can I count myself? I felt I literally needed her permission to count myself in this identity. Meanwhile, I was actively partnered to a woman, but most people at work didn't know. And so I wondered, does it matter? And maybe some of you are familiar with this like really unique cocktail of imposter syndrome, guilt, and self-doubt. So on the one hand, who am I to claim this identity without having suffered for it? And on the other, representation matters. And am I perpetuating the biases against this community because I'm not public with this identity? And for me, invisibility came with both privilege and pain. It granted me access to power and a perception of like fitting in both in my professional life and in my Catholic extended family in the deep South. I spent years navigating that concurrent relief and discomfort, hiding even from myself in ways I'm still processing. But as violence continues against members of the LGBTQ plus community here in Louisiana, across the country, and especially here in New Orleans and in Louisiana, I felt a responsibility to use my privilege and share my truth. So earlier this year, I wrote a deeply personal essay in the Huffington Post about my journey coming out publicly at the ripe old age of 37. And the thing that kept coming up for me again and again as I was writing it and in the reaction to it is I kept seeing, you know, it's not, identity isn't based on like some secret point system that allows others to determine if you count. It's deeply personal and it's yours. It's your exploration to navigate. The reaction to that piece, which I'll you know, continue to share about, is that that authenticity and identity continue to change and vary over time and in different settings at work. So the reason I'm putting this together in some ways is my own process and evolution that I've heard echoed in so many other people. The intersection of our professional lives and more personal identities can be really difficult to navigate. And that's our focus today. So I want to pause here and shout out to Ray for all of that great data analytics. Um, I see you. I see you. Um, and, and ask the question, like, do any of you relate to that experience, that tension of wondering, do I count in this identity or wondering, when should I share this? Who am I to take up space in this movement? Are those themes familiar? Give me a thumbs up in the chat or a yes some sort of response, oh, a, a thousand percent, that'll, that'll work, some sort of um, acknowledgement if this feels familiar. Mm. Yeah, Ray says, am I allowed to ask for my pronouns anywhere if I don't ask for them everywhere? <gasps> this question of Am I being, am I hiding myself? Am I being inauthentic? Am I being untruthful if I've shared this publicly, but I'm not sharing it in this setting? Does it make it, does it do, do I question my value? Do I wonder how I take up space in the world? So a lot has changed in the last few years when it comes to identity at work. In my own experience, the legislative, social, and physical attacks against members of the queer community left me with an urgency to come out. Alternatively, for Black professionals, our collective reckoning with racial injustice brought their identities to the forefront, whether they liked it or not. As my friend Veronica says, she can't leave her Blackness at home. She is always visibly Black. And in these last few years, many of us have gotten new identities, new professional roles, had kiddos. And as we're navigating that, as we're all, you know, in the, like following COVID and integrating in all of these work dynamics, it's confusing. PwC, the artist formerly known as Price Waterhouse Coopers, big consulting firm, 
came out with a study that said one of the big factors in the great resignation was people felt like they couldn't be their true selves at work. And in the past, it might have felt more comfortable to have this division between our personal and professional lives. But that line has been blurred, maybe even erased in the last few years. And some folks are, you know, maybe trying to reestablish that boundary without acknowledging that the cultural context has changed. I'm going to make it explicit. For generations, people who were professionals were white, cisgender, heterosexual dudes, right? And workplaces became more diverse, but professionals still meant aligned with that dominant culture from how we talk, how we manage our time, our appearance. And that's changing, but I think we need to be really clear that we're at this inflection point with authenticity at work, where many of us are wondering, and I think this is particularly true for those of us with marginalized identities, what it means to show up and take up space at work, and how do I show up in a way that feels true, but doesn't complicate my work life. So I want to do a quick poll, and I want to, before we share it, Sarah, pause, please. I want to get a gut reaction, right? So don't, my, I'm like the queen of overthinking. So I'm like, give me a ton of time and I can spend all damn day on this. I could justify every one of these answers, but give me your gut reaction. So you're going to look at this list of things and you're going to say, which would be the easiest things for me to share at work? That's the first question. Easy peasy, no hesitation. We're like chit-chatting before a meeting, boop, 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 pick three. And then I want you to pick three that would be like, Oh, hell no. Like, I would rather eat my own hand than say this in public. All right? Any questions before Sarah shares it in the chat? All right, let's do it. All right, I'm going to give you a few moments. But you're not going to have long. Wait, Lelia, do these questions say the same thing? They do say the same thing because the first one is which ones are easy and the first, oh crap, they do say the same thing. You are correct, Ray. Great catch. Thank you. I'm going to just pause, please. All right. Hit a refresh if you would. Great catch. I wanted to be sure the list was in the same order and then, you know, here we are. Okay, fabulous. And this is totally anonymous. I have no idea who is answering this how, and I'm going to share the results on the aggregate in a moment. Also, the data nerd in me is really excited about this. Okay, so take another 30 seconds. Confirm for me you cannot hear the jackhammering next door. Give me a thumbs up if you do not hear jackhammering. Terrific. That's saved just special for me. Thanks, neighbors. Okay. So I'm going to share my screen. And y'all are going to see how interesting these results are. So what do we notice? Oh, my God, I missed, we missed one. There we go. Pop into the chat or raise your hand to share what you notice about what's easy versus what's difficult. Yeah, Katie says relationship status is easy and hard to share. One person thinks neurodiversity is easy to share. One person said, many people say that would be very difficult to share. Many people said caregiving responsibilities when it comes to talking about um, children is way easier than talking about um, adults or elder care responsibilities. Yeah. Some people say it's, it's really difficult because I'm a private person. 
And I don't, I wouldn't share this even more broadly. Easy to share about your kids, but not easy to share about your difficulty having children. Less personal info is easier to share. Division on the gender role binary. Yeah. And so what I wanna, the purpose of this activity for me is to demonstrate for each person, these things could be true. The reverse could be true, right? In, in this space, relationship status can go from both very easy and very difficult. Sexual orientation for three of folks, that's easy peasy. For 12 of us, really challenging. And so the same, the very same topic could be really deeply personal for one person and feel like, absolutely not, rather eat my own hands. And for others, it's like, oh yeah, easy, no big deal. Yeah. Okay, so now in breakouts, you're gonna share your experiences filling out the survey, not your specifics. So what I mean by that is we're gonna introduce ourselves and identify a team name. You can use adjective plus animal. That's a format I really love. I like um, like persnickety possum, possums. I could only think of pineapples and that's because my earrings are pineapples. Persnickety possums, for example. Elect a team captain who will share your results either on the chat or on camera. And then add your pick three to your answers on the joy book. Sarah, if you could share the joy book in the chat again, I would appreciate it. And this is on page two of your joy book is all of these instructions. And that'll break it down. And you're going to add how you answer these just for your reference. And then discuss how it might be different in different settings. So I want you to imagine you're having a conversation with your CEO versus you're having a conversation with your work best friend. Imagine over time, right? How might your answers have been different five years ago? Five years ago, I would have been like, oh, hell no sexual orientation. And now, easy peasy, five years from now, maybe caregiving responsibilities feel really intense, right? Like my parents have been in and out of good health. And right now I feel very comfortable talking about when my mom was sick in the past and I was a caregiver. But talking about it firsthand right now, if it was current, might be really different. Talking about my miscarriage that was five years ago doesn't feel difficult. But when it happened, really tricky. And then think about a different place you've worked, right? Maybe it would be different in a different workplace that was more collegial or less. Any questions? So you'll have 10 minutes in the breakouts. You'll introduce yourself and identify a team name. Two, elect a team captain. Three, just look over your um, survey responses. That's all listed in your joy book for reference. And then discuss how it might change over time. Does that make sense? Give me a thumbs up if you're ready to go. Awesome. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name's Nick. I am representing the Twisty tri Triceratops. That's, of course, a la the, the tornado warning that we're watched that we're under here in New Orleans. And Catherine's child's current uh, animal obsession. <laughs> Um, what, what, I, what our, my observations were of our team answers is that, um, the easier, the easier information to share felt lower stakes to the individual, um, things like holiday plans, pop culture. Although I, I did say, I don't like sharing my pop culture interests because I'm usually terribly embarrassed of them. Um, so that was a little bit easier, but we did note that what may feel low stakes to one person can feel high stakes to another um, at any different point. And the, the things that were a little more difficult to share were, um, well, here's some examples. Pregnancy issues, it's a deeply emotional uh, topic. Caregiving, you may be fearing judgment. Uh, sexual orientation, you might be private about how you disclose that orientation. So um, that's where we that's where we landed with uh, what we wanted to share. Oh, Nick and the Twisty Triceratops says, thank you very much. One thing I'll note is I was putting this list together. I thought about holiday plans and how they might feel different for someone who is estranged from their family. Someone who I'm close to just went through a breakup and would normally have been with his partner, but is now uncertain about his plans. And so what feels like easy chit chat to one person might not feel easy to another. And I love that thread that I heard um, in yours as well. And then the pop culture references, um, I think of people who maybe didn't have the same access to TV growing up or to entertainment, people who didn't grow up in this country, 
that feels like super easy breezy. But for some people that can feel really othering of like, no, I didn't watch Saved by the Bell. I don't know that reference to Zach Morris, which like, love me as in Zach. Well, I love the new series. doesn't matter. Anyway, um, thank you, Nick and the twisty Triceratopsis. Ray, take it away. Please share your team name and then the themes that y'all discussed. Yes. So our team name was the Bubbly Bullfrogs. And <laughs> um, similarly, holidays in particular were like, well, um, the theme that came out of the holiday talk in particular was that sometimes sharing is a navigation of boundaries, both of your own and also like, oh, am I going to rain on somebody else's parade because I want to talk about Christmas and they don't. Um, so like, how do you navigate um, both boundary and safety? Um, what feels safe to one person might not feel safe to another. And also like, we don't want to talk about it if it doesn't spark joy. So in addition mm. to feeling safe, like if it's not interesting, I also don't want to talk about it. And alas, that it's easier to share information if you're proud of the subject, but it's harder mm. to share if you're um, embarrassed or unsure. Yeah. If you're embarrassed or unsure, and one other that I would add there is, or concerned about judgment, right? And I think that was a theme you shared earlier is like, wondering how this is going to be received um, can also impact how we show up. All right. Thank you, Ray and Bubbly Bullfrogs. All right, Lindsay, please. Yeah. So, I mean, um, there were a lot of things. Oh, I forgot. We were the lounging palm skis. Um, and a palm ski is a Pomeranian husky for those who are not in the know. Um, so, I mean, a lot of the things that have come up so far were things that were also shared in our group, but a big thing was like the mutual trust of who's on the other end of receiving the information and how safe we feel. And the safety wasn't just psychological safety, but also literal safety. Like if I tell somebody about, you know, reproduction or whether or not I'm bringing a child into this world or adopting or whatever, is that going to impact how I'll be perceived in this job? Am I going to be asked to take on more work if I don't have a child, et cetera? So there was some of this literal safety in addition to the psychological safety that came up. Mm. Thank you for flagging that really important distinction. And one thing that, so, and thank you to the, mm, I'm not gonna get there, lounging palm skis? Palm skis, I was not in the know, just to clarify. Um, I think something that's really important to name here is how when we have more visible identities, that puts us at greater social, physical, and professional risk. And sometimes disclosing an invisible identity can come with those same that same sense of threat. And it's really important to name the way that marginalization influences this, right? And so for people who are of childbearing age in a anti-choice state like Louisiana, talking about reproduction can be, you could end up incarcerated, right? Like there are very clear risks for black and brown people, for people with disabilities, queer and trans people who visibly present that way. There's a different level of risk that's important to acknowledge and name. And so we're talking about kind of visible and invisible identities, right? And acknowledging all of the different facets of these experiences that we bring to work, right? Because it's both identity and experience. I was really clear in, in the list I created that it's both. And so we think of the, there are a million different stories that come to mind to share with you all, but I wanna share just a few. So one is my friend, Laura Cathcart Robbins. She's a phenomenal writer and she attended a um, writer's retreat with 600 people in attendance. She was so excited to go. And then she walked into the room and in a room of 600 people, she was the only black person present. She wrote a viral article for the Huffington Post about her experience and described it as, I'm more than a little shocked, I'm deeply saddened. She imagined how white people would feel being in that room of 600 people, considered leaving, wondering, would anyone blame me? She describes feeling tears prickling at the back of her eyes. And then the day after her article came out, she had over 500 messages from people who, as she says, were from different races, creeds, and nationalities, who said they too had felt othered and connected to their story, to her story. And now on her podcast, the only one in the room, she's interviewed people whose experience or identity left them feeling othered, left them feeling isolated as they navigated everything from sobriety to gender identity to having been adopted. 
And it's powerful to witness the universality of that experience. That sense of isolation, of being othered is universal because at some level, we all crave that deep sense of belonging. And so we're, that's a visible identity we can talk about. There's another visible identity that I've really found resonant on Instagram. It's someone talking about her visible identity and how it shows up. And this person's name is Nina Tame. She is smart and charming and she describes herself as sometimes sweary and the disabled stepmom you never knew you needed. She talks about specific access challenges and rude comments as she, rude comments she experiences as a wheelchair user. She had this great essay where she was like, don't make it weird, right? Just be like, if a kid comes up to me and is like, why is that person in a wheelchair? Be like, oh, she uses it to get around, right? Like it doesn't have to be this big deal. But for her, she's talked about her disability journey. And it challenges my thinking about my own interactions with people using mobility aids. It reminds me of an interview I did with the um, world champion mono skier who set the Paralympic history, um, Chris Waddell who felt like he had to summit Mount Kilimanjaro solo on a hand cycle. And he, he, this is his language. So people would have to see me and the hundreds of millions of people in the world like me who are so often invisible because we're taught it's impolite to stare at someone who looks different, right? I mean, I remember growing up and my mom saying, don't stare. And so even with this very visible disability, Nina Tame and Chris Waddell talk about not getting acknowledged, no one making eye contact with them. And so when we think about visibility, think about how we interact with it, how we engage and, and our own emotions about it. And now I wanna talk a little bit about invisible identities. So I was working with a coaching client who reached out in May, March of 2020. So she was living just outside of a city with an extremely high transmission rate. Felt like she couldn't leave her apartment building for weeks. And she kept talking in veiled terms about a chronic health condition and referencing it throughout our conversations. And I, at some point said, you know what, would it be helpful for me to share a little bit about my own experience with a chronic health condition? Y'all, and she said, yes. Y'all, it turns out we have the same one. And she hadn't said it. And I, I don't think I'd ever brought it into a coaching conversation before. It just hadn't been relevant. But I was uniquely situated to coach her and it was her first time in a professional relationship with someone who knew her disease status. At one point she said, I can't keep doing this to myself, right? Like talking about pushing herself really hard and, and moving through pain. And I said, but here's the thing you could. And I told her a story about how I went to, I was in the emergency room in Washington, DC. I was at a work event and I'd ended up in the hospital. And the only thing I kept asking the doctors, I was like, you give me whatever you need to give me so I can be in Chicago in three days to see Taylor Swift on the 1989 tour. I was like, whatever it takes. And so they shot me up with God knows what. I like came home to New Orleans because my employer was like, go home. You're really sick. And I was like, okay, but I'm still going to this concert. Then I went and it was utterly miserable, right? I was in debilitating pain that took my breath away. And yet... I like made it, I pushed through and I told that story and I think it really supported her. She describes now in saying, working with you was like a light switch. It was permission to have that part of myself acknowledged, to acknowledge I have needs. Whether it's asking at work for an accommodation, working from home, rescheduling a meeting. I've been able to be more genuine with people at work. Bring into that space where I could have just hidden it. I'm able to be more in touch with my needs. And so when I think about this, for me, I mean, and it was also kind of life altering for me on a, on a personal front. She was the first person my age who I had ever met who struggled with this illness. And I've been in remission for a while, but it radically changed how I thought about something that I struggled with for 15 years. And when I deal with it now, I deal with it in a really different way because we have that mutuality. Now, the odds that you're like going to happen to have the same chronic illness as someone you're in conversation with, not super high. But what I recognize is how disclosure informed and deepened our relationship. Now, I want to share one more story real quick. I don't have time. I really want to, though. So we'll do another session. It's going to be great. Uh, give me a thumbs up if you would want to do another session. I don't want to... Um, 
have this go super long because I know folks have one o'clock or, you know, meetings on the hour. We will come back to this really juicy story I wanted to tell you, but I respect your time. And I want to acknowledge that not everyone has this kind of like deep loving connection with the people they work with. Some of you work for people who to quote my friend, Sarah, we'll call them like a douche canoe, right? Like just a real garbage human. And that concern that you might have about what's true to you, that part of yourself that you're hesitant to show, maybe that's a really healthy choice for you. Maybe there's psychological safety in keeping things more close to your chest. An example for me is I have agency, you know, who I, who I surround myself with. But if I'm meeting with a new client, I don't kick it off by saying, my sister used to dress me up in costume and call me baby rock bop. I used to be a roller derby cheerleader. And my favorite song is the entire soundtrack to the movie Dirty Dancing. Even though all of those things are very true to me, I don't have to share them for them to want to work with me, for me to be trustworthy and honest. And I want to come back to that theme we heard again and again, thanks to Ray's excellent data analysis. I don't remember the specific number, but we heard over and over honesty feeling important. Just as I've said, it's not inauthentic not to share. It's not dishonest not to share. And so the thing that has been so important to me, especially as I've been more out with my sexual orientation and relationship model, is that I'm not inauthentic if I'm not constantly talking about every facet of it. And so the same is true for our more vulnerable identities and experiences. I had like my silly Mardi Gras headdress on. If you're feeling insecure about like, oh, do I have to share this? Just picture me in my Mardi Gras headdress. I'm not always wearing it. But everybody can still, you know, trust me and think I'm reliable. There's no single answer about how to show up. It's different for each person and situation. And here's what I know. Authenticity is medicine. When we show up as our full selves, it gives others permission to do the same. So I want to pause here and ask what's one reflection or takeaway from today? And you can pop it into the chat. Yeah, brilliant conversation happening in the chat right now. Yeah. No single answer on how to show up. It's different for each person. Authenticity is medicine. Yeah. Oh, not disclosing can also be a healthy protective mechanism and worth protecting. It can look different in different settings. Mm. What's easy for me to share may not be easy for everyone else. Oh, it's interesting. Okay, Katie, I want to follow up on that. So the opposite of authenticity isn't being inauthentic. It's being guarded. And I would, I would like, I think that's evolving because I think as Ray said, the protective mechanisms can sometimes be really healthy and important. And so I want to offer that like invitation that, that being guarded is sometimes your healthiest option. Um, wonderful. 